two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for November 2nd, 2023. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Dolowski? Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Ms. Shea? Dr. Whitstead? Present. Ms. Myers? Myers? Present. Ms. Fisher? Present. And Mr. Kearns. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Please call and note the names of any other staff members participating in the meeting. There's no one else. Okay, thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then stating their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by stating their name first and speaking. This will allow for accurate recognition of those who speak out. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee members will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote? Assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. We have about three things on the agenda for today. Um, so we will start unless Dr. DiDonato has anything she wants to start with. We'll yeah. start with non-public special education facilities. And I think we have Ms. Myers and Ms. Bally on hand to go through um, that with us. Hello, it's just me today. Uh, oh. Ms. Bailey is out, is out. So That's everyone. Fine. Sorry, I should have put it all together, but I didn't. <laughs> no worries, it's totally fine. Um, so I know everyone probably had the opportunity to review the PowerPoint. So our non-public facilities contract may seem familiar to this group. Um, we come back with this contract every time we add a new non-public facility to the contract. So we have the general um, non-public contract for all the schools. Um, our students who are receiving services through private separate day are accessing. Um, and when a student is placed into a facility that is not currently listed on the contract, um, all are MSD approved facilities, but anytime we add another one, we're gonna bring it back to the board to add that, um, add that name of the facility to the contract. So um, for this contract, there is, we're adding uh, both Perkins and um, Washington, the Lab School of Washington. So that, any questions? Do any board members have any questions? I just have one and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Sorry. What are the um like what are the criteria for um for students to get into non-public funded schools? Yeah, so it's an IEP team decision. Um so it uh and as part of the IEP team meets to review annually, of course, um for students um based on their data um and based on students' progress and ultimately their needs. So if the IEP team makes a decision for um the least restrictive environment to be private separate day, then a student um is then referred to a non-public school. So their IEP reflects private separate day. Um, and then ultimately we refer out to um, schools who could meet the needs of that IEP. And those are private facilities um, approved 
MSD approved non-public private school facilities. So um, they then determine whether or not that they're able to accept the student. Um, they generally, the student might tour with their family, they might interview the family, um, and then the, an offer is made um, for that seat in the building, um, and then the student starts. So it all goes through the IEP team process based on the student's um, present levels of performance, their needs, their goals and objectives, supplementary aids and services, and then ultimately um, the LRE is determined for the student. And if that LRE is determined to be private separate day, then they would be accessing a non-public school for those services. And about how many students do, you, do we have in non-public um, yeah, we have approximately 700 students accessing non-public school at this point. At time, and are they are they considered now? Do they are they considered enrolled in their homeschool at all, or do they have any connection with their homeschool as far as like funding or are they um, included in that enrollment data? Does that make sense? Or like, um, yeah. So they. You know, so we have the sorry. Nope. Nope. Sorry. I'm sorry. I was. Go ahead, and then I'll finish. The, the per people cost. Mm -hmm. Like, is that uh, for them to go, I guess, are we paying that to the school that they're attending, or does do we get, yep. I mean, what is that, how does that work? Yep, I can explain all of that. So, yes, they're part okay. of our total enrollment for um, Baltimore County Public Schools. They are Baltimore County Public School student. Um, the way funding works for non-public schools is the student is, um, we, there's a base rate kind of thing, a base rate that is, um, we pay outright for every student. So, I'm going to, talk this through of like a hundred thousand dollar let's say tuition so for every student we would pay thirty thousand dollars okay above the thirty thousand dollars the remainder of that money so that remaining seventy thousand um, dollars we pay thirty percent and the state pays seventy percent above that so we then that amount gets added together so it's the 30 plus that remaining um percentage is what we pay for that tuition the state baltimore county pays the the full tuition and then the state reimburses us for that amount um, and that there's several reimbursements that are made to the system over the year um, but yeah so it's a joint kind of tuition um, we definitely they're in our account for funding for our system um, and then we pay the schools with that money and then um, like I said then the the remaining cost is then split between us and the state for that total amount paid did that help yeah Okay, it's a bit complicated with non-public tuition. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ms. Pomfrey, did you have a question? Just a quick question. So when the IEP team decides that um, an LREG placement is needed, is there, do you refer to the list of schools or do you, I guess, does, do you look at a list or do you go by the student and choose a school and that then that school is added to the list, sort of like how we're adding to right now? Oh, yeah. So um, great question. So ultimately, there's a lot of schools on the list already. Um, so the majority, we have case managers that cover all of our schools. We do it based on the needs of the student. So um, most most students needs can be met within this within the schools that are that are typically used that we have on that list. There are times when whether the needs are such um, Perkins, for example, is a very specialized um, school for um, students that have visual impairment as well as they have a residential component. Um, so that is a school where um, it is very a, a different kind of um, service delivery. And none of the, the current schools that we we're using were able to meet the needs of the student um, or they weren't accepted. So then we went to this other option, which is an MSD approved school as well. So it depends. Um, most times it can be one of the ones on the list, but it really depends on the needs of the student. The one um, the, uh, as far as adding the lab school of um, Washington, I believe that's coming through um uh, a settlement which also is what will happen as far as with um our office of law um depending on circumstances involved there are times that part of resolution if there was a question about um kind of concern about how the student was performing sometimes that we go through resolution for a student's access non-public as well and that's what that one is um so it's not one of our typical schools um but it is an msc approved so it's being added to the list Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a quick question. So with Washington Lab School, what about transportation if they're a Baltimore County resident? So um, because that is actually, so because it's um, come, that's actually part of a resolution 
um, more than likely the parent has agreed to transport to that facility, um, which is sometimes written into what that agreement is. Um, but ultimately we are responsible for transportation, which, and we look for schools that are as close to the student's home, home as possible. Also per part of the IEP team process, we're required to do that. So ultimately most times we are placing as close to the student's home school as possible, which also kind of goes to Ms. Pumphrey's question about how we look at those. Um, but then when it is something outside of that, there are times where that might be, um, you know, part of the process that the parent has either agreed to transport. And if not, and we're really truly having to place for other reasons then we would be responsible for providing transportation. And when that happens, we actually work with the county where the student, sometimes we work with the county where the student is being serviced and work with them for that. Is the Baltimore Lab School the same as the Washington? I mean, are they they connected or just happened? To um, not as much as they used to be. OK, all right. Just FYI. OK, yeah. any other um, questions? OK, thank you, Miss Myers. Thanks. Um, we're now going to discuss and answer any questions concerning the cosmetology supplies. We go from one thing, one extreme to the next. Well, we need to do a vote on the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Um, may I have a motion to approve the um, non-public special education facilities contract? So moves Stolesky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Cox, may we have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. OK, now we will discuss and answer any questions about the cosmetology supplies. And I is our Miss um, Shea and Miss Fisher ready? Oh, there's Miss Fisher. OK. Hi, everyone. All right, go ahead. Um, so this is a modification. And so um, we can certainly go through any of the we can go to the next slide that we're seeking. Uh oh, Mr. Corns, what happened? Oh, there he is. <laughs> you can just talk us through it, Mr. Okay. All right. So, um, the next slide is um, so really, this contract is going to be providing it provides materials for students in the cosmetology careers program and this is looking to add additional funding so that we will be able to we've got some planned spending um, this year and what this the biggest reason why we have a modification is when uh, in 2021 the CT program started providing a cosmetology kit for each student in the program and this really was a piece that allowed all students to have access to it and the kits um, go with the student from the beginning of the program through the completion of the program. And as we have seen in the last couple of years, six significant increases in just the cost of items. And so this would be to finish this out the rest of this contract for this year. OK, thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Fisher about the cosmetology? I had a chance to go to Western, so it's um, pretty cool what they're doing there. Any questions from board members? Ms. Dolesky, do you have a question? Nope. Okay. So may I have a motion to approve the contract 313-19 um, for cosmetology supplies? So moves Dolesky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Governor. Thank you. May we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? It's Ms. Lichter. Yes. Ms. Pumphrey. Yes, sorry. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is a I, presentation. I do have one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought of it. So for the, um, and thank you, for the professional level kit, um, the $600 cost, are there any grants or any ways to, to look into subsidizing that? I don't know what's available, but. Well, we do currently use our Perkins funding largely to to um, to provide this. And so that is kind of coming from one of those pieces. Um, that's one of the places that the funding is coming from. Um, certainly we can always look at other funding sources as well. OK, thank you. 
Thank you. We we'll now have a presentation on elementary advanced academic books. Um, so Dr. Wisted and Mr. Kearns. Okay. Oh, there we are. There it is. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I guess I can uh, go ahead and begin. Before we get into uh, the selection process, which is what I want to talk about a little bit, I want to explain why we're bringing forward elementary ELA text for our advanced students. Um, as you all may know, we adopted a new elementary ELA curriculum, uh, the HMHN to reading curriculum. I know you know that because you're you're getting updates on it at all of your meetings. Um, so you're very aware of the new curriculum that we have in elementary ELA. Well, prior to uh, the adoption of HMH into reading, for our advanced ELA students in elementary school, we had uh, a program uh, that we referred to as the Accelerated Reading Pathway. And that consisted of a variety of, of different texts that had been selected for uh, use with our advanced students, along with a curricula that was written for those advanced text uh, that we called um, advanced planners or acceleration pathway planners. Uh, when we switched to the HMH into reading curriculum, we matched up the accelerated pathway texts and planners that we had with the modules for HMH into reading. And so wherever we had an existing planner and advanced text that matched up with um, the the module topic and the essential question for the module in HMH, uh, we were able to provide that text in that curriculum or, or that planner uh, for that particular uh, module in whatever grade it may have been. But as we went through, as you might expect, uh, not all of the modules and the uh, text that we already had uh, match up perfectly. You wouldn't necessarily expect them to, and they didn't. And so in analyzing what we had and looking at all of the different modules, basically 60 modules in kindergarten through fifth grade in HMH, uh, we found that 25 of those modules didn't have a text that was already approved that we already had a planner for that matched with um, the module topic and the essential question for that module. And so that was the impetus for us uh, trying to identify additional text that we could have approved uh, that could sort of um, fill in those holes or go into those 25 modules in HMH into reading uh, that the uh, things that we already had as part of the curriculum didn't didn't already match up with or didn't already fit. So uh, I probably should have had a slide uh, to with some nice graphics to help explain all that, but uh, I didn't think about it until uh, after I had already submitted the slide. So, so my apologies, uh, but I hope that explanation helps to sort of give you an understanding understanding of why we're bringing forward uh, these additional texts for advanced students in elementary ELA. So uh, Mr. Corns, we can go to the next slide. And I want to just talk a little bit about the selection process. And so uh, board policy 6002, uh, dictates or, or explains uh, the selection, the criteria for the selection of instructional materials. And really when it comes to content of the materials, uh, the thing, there were really two things that we were looking for. One is, uh, as the policy 6002 states, we wanted instructional materials uh, that reflected the diversity of the students and staff here in Baltimore County Public Schools. And uh, that helped us um, help students to sort of move toward a better understanding and appreciation of culture, class, language, ethnicity, and so on uh, per the policy 6002. And so that was one of the criteria that we really used in evaluating the text for selection. And then uh, Mr. Corns, if we can go to the next slide, uh, the second criteria that we were really interested in in terms of thinking about has to do with uh, the uh, Code of Maryland regulation that governs gifted education in the state of Maryland, which is 13A0407. And uh, sort of in a nutshell, uh, what COMAR, um, the, the gifted ed COMAR uh, regulation states is that you, you have to have something different for your uh, kids who are identified as GT. And so we need to have things, materials that are appropriately differentiated, that accelerate, extend, enrich content strategies and products. And so when we were looking for text that um, we, kind of wanted to put forward for your approval, uh, we were interested in texts that uh, we felt meet, met these requirements for Comar along with the requirements for 6002. And then uh, finally, uh, next slide, uh, Mr. Corns, uh, the process itself, um, 
uh, is dictated in Rule 6002, and so the instructional materials have to be on public display. We've had them on public display here in the Jefferson Building on the fourth floor, which is where our offices are located. Uh, so the the texts that we are putting forward have been out there for um, quite a while, actually. Uh, we put out uh, the notification to the public. We have it on the um, advanced academic section of the BCPS website. And then in addition to that, uh, it was actually on uh, the splash page, the front page of the BCPS website uh, for 14 days just to draw additional attention to it. So if any members of the public uh, wanted to come out and take a look and review those books, they would have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and then of course there has to be a selection committee. And so we put together a committee um, that consisted of 44 reviewers. Um, they were from all sorts of different uh, stakeholder groups within Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, we certainly collaborated with our uh, friends in the ELA uh, and other, actually some other offices as well in uh, CNI, uh, but we also had classroom teachers, reading specialists, uh, and fam uh, community members, parents, families um, as part of that selection committee. I do want to emphasize, because I don't want to mislead anybody, of uh, 44 people didn't review every single book um, because we're actually putting forward a total of, uh, I think it's 50, uh, 57 texts, I think is the total number. So all 44 people didn't read all 57 texts. Would have been a daunting prospect for them to do that. But uh, every text had at least four to five reviewers who read that and provided feedback uh, to us. But uh, in total, uh, there were 44 reviewers who took a look at uh, these materials and provided us with feedback. Um, some of that feedback you have available to you. We submitted a document along with this PowerPoint uh, that um, has sort of a summary of the reviews that uh, these various folks gave us. So um, it, you, you have that available to you as well. If you didn't have the chance to read it yet, you can certainly look it over uh, at your convenience, but it has a list of all of the text. It has uh, some uh, relevant notes from uh, and feedback from our reviewers who reviewed each text. And it also identifies uh, any potential uh, sensitive issues that are involved in each one of those texts. So uh, that chart uh, was submitted. I assume you all have that uh, available to you to look at if you would like. Um, and so I'm going to stop and, and sort of ask if, if anybody has any questions either about the process, about our criteria, or about any of the specific books. I will answer any questions that I'm able to at this time. By the way, I should mention I have all of the books uh, kind of behind me. So even though we're not in person and so you can't pick up the book and look at it, if you have a question about a particular book, I will do my best to give an impromptu book talk <laughs> if that would be helpful for anyone. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kearns. You're welcome. Um, any questions from board members? I have, I have one. Um, so as far as like it being new materials and the policy of um, it being on at, if we're public, being you know have public access or be on display for I think it was 14 days. Mm -hmm. Where are we in that process? Uh, we're we're past the 14 days. So they've already been out. Uh, as I said, they they've been on public display here in the Jefferson Building for uh, uh, probably almost two months. Um, but uh, but in terms of the 14 days uh, with it being advertised, particularly on the splash page, we had it as I said on our advanced academics web page. But then uh, we realized that a lot of people aren't necessarily going to see it just on our web page, and so we put it out. Um, uh, for public notice on the splash page, on the front page of the landing page of the BCPS website. And so they've been up for uh, over 14 days since we uh, put that announcement on the uh, on the landing page, on the BCPS landing page. So we're past that time frame at this point. Was Though I should, I'm sorry, sorry I, go ahead. I, I, no, I just was going to say, instead of just putting it on the web page, was there any like email effort as far as reaching the students at the, and the community that will be using these books or is this was it just on the web page i mean were the schools principals notified of like the parents to ask where these books were they could find these books was that no that, no that not it's not part of the typical process, uh, at least not to my knowledge. Um, the the uh, academic offices put forward texts uh, on a more regular basis than my office does, but I, I don't believe that trying to email or um, notify parents through the schools is is typically part of the process. It's usually the advertised on the web page, um, and and then if community members uh, see that on the web page and they're interested, uh, they're able to come up and view the books. 
the, so the when, if, oh, sorry. Yeah, I just, well, I just want to make, because if, when you read that policy displayed before the public, I think that you would have a broader sense of just putting it on the web page and just having it at your building. Um, that's where I'm kind of coming to. Like I, what I read displayed for the public, I feel like as a parent or a teacher or a student, I would I would know where that was. Does that make so sense? To, yeah, ahead, yeah. You, Ms. Tumman asked you to actually to that point, it was actually a brought up in curriculum committee because, or a follow-up question after curriculum committee about where um, the books, the book list was located because it was actually just on the website for the advanced academic office and taking that feedback we reached out to communications to get it put on the front page of the website so it's of the main bcps website so it was actually something that anyone who just even logged onto our website it was one of those big things at the top um, and then there was the list linked to it of the book so just even as a follow-up to and i guess this was several weeks ago in curriculum committee i had gotten a follow-up email about um, where the list was located. And in response to that, seeing that it was just on the internal like website, we talked with communications and are adding that to our process, that it will be on our main page um, so that again, it provides that more public display. Um, so it was as soon as you logged into the BCPS website, it was like there. Um, so we, we were attempting to even give more publicity to it than just on, on a single office's webpage too. No, and I, and I appreciate that. I just, if I didn't know that you were going to be getting these books, I wouldn't have a reason to go to the BCPS's website to look to, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. how are people even aware that they're getting, we're getting new books? You know what I mean? Like, why would they think to look for it? It is 14 days, but if you don't even know that these new books are being purchased or being brought into the curriculum, why would you think to look for it, even on the front page of, like, it, it's, it needs to be something that you're targeting to go to the website for, but you need to know to go there to target it. Does that make sense? I'm, I know I say that all the time, but like there's, because I'm in curriculum to me, I knew this was coming up and I looked at the list, I, I went through it, but I don't think as a parent with a student that was in advance, um, you know, was in advance track for ELA, I would have any idea that we were getting these, these new books coming in. And I most probably really don't really, aren't bothered by it, whatever, and we'll make that decision. But when we say that we're gonna make it public, I think we, I don't know, owe it, have a little bit more transparency with it than just putting it on the front page because if you don't even know that it's coming, why would you look for it? I, I'm trying very hard to. No, I think, Ms. Dominic, do you mean like the boundary studies as far as when there's a meeting coming up, there's like a blast about the meeting, even if you're not part of that boundary, that community, you're still going to get that email no, I mean, so, right well if you're uh, it's just right. yeah basically like just saying hey these um check out these new we're getting um advanced academics ela is getting some new books if, you, if you're interested they're on the front page like there's got to be an email of something coming out like that if, and when we have you know our we have to let the public for our own meeting um in advance you know it's not we can't just put it on the website and say oh that's enough we need to send out a, an email too so I, I'm, that's kind of where I'm going with that. And I, I feel like we, if we're adding something new to our to the curriculum in all our schools, we should give more advance notice to everyone in that school building, and that that would be affected. Right. Well, this would be system wide because because all of our schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's certainly something that, you know, we can take back and talk about a little, you know, more of our internal process as far as, you know, creating a, a wider scope of, of advertisement for those kinds of things. Um, so that, you know, to your point, Mr. Manowski, parents are more aware than just they happen to onto our website. So we we attempted to take it one step further than the internal website, but we, we can continue to look at what are the ways that we might be able to enhance that even more to get uh, more awareness. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pick on you. I think that was great that it was it was brought up that. But again, I wouldn't have any idea about this if it wasn't that it, I'm on the curriculum committee. And I'm not that my children are that I know of are <laughs> advanced ELA yet. I just, um, so, but I'm but they're in elementary school, and I didn't get anything uh, about added curriculum. Oh, well, yeah, HMH. But um, as far as stories and and when something new is being introduced, uh, I, I think more 
you know, community members are getting involved and liking to know what's, you know, being brought into the school building. And I, I think we owe it to, you know, be more transparent about it. Especially if we say we're going to, you know, show it before the public. It's an, that's where I was going. And, and I didn't mean to pick one on you. I, I think across no, the board. No, no, no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, no, I appreciate it. No, and I don't have any issue with the books at all. I just, <laughs> I just wanted um, a better place. Uh, or mm-hmm. just to, it's not to feel like we're, it kind of feels like we're hiding it a little. I know it's right there on the front page, but we also, there's no community input. There's no, it's just us, you know, we're the ones that get to decide yes or no. And we don't get any input from, you know, the schools or anyone else. So it's, it's just our decision, I guess, without any input. Well, there are the reviewers that are made up of teachers and reading specialists and parents on the committee who do review the book. So that is, that is one mechanism for a, a group of people to provide feedback. But I but I hear what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I just, this is uh, Melissa Wissett. I just want to also bring up that, you know, books are um, typically added every year, not just for advanced academics, just in general. Uh, novels, you know, new novels are reviewed, and so maybe it's something that the policy review committee could talk about being more specific um, with what public display should mean, um, you know, because it'll, it might be a lot of communication um, to families, you know, and we just want to be purposeful about um, how many calls they get you know, throughout a year for, for different things. So, um, you know, I think that's what you were maybe suggesting that a call go out or or an email or something. So broader, broader there's gotta be a balance, I guess. Right. right, just a broad, maybe just a broad, an effort for broader communication. Um, right, I did broader learn. Outreach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know you said policy and review, um, Dr. West said. I did learn from last meeting about Robert's rule. I always learn when I screw up that one committee can't make a motion for another committee's work. So that was new learning for me. It would have <laughs> saved us time, but we didn't know that. And I'll never I learned forget. as well. I learned right. as well. So that was good. I'll never forget it. But because we do have somebody from the policy review committee on here. <laughs> That those bugs do get planted in her ear. Um, Ms. Zaleski, did you have a question? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Ms. Dominowski, I thought you brought up some great points. Um, I would have never known either about the chance to review the books for 14 days. So you guys have done a great job raising public awareness, but certainly like a blast email, I think would be great as well. Um, just a question about the reviewers that are parents. Mm-hmm. Um, how many parents are on the committee and how is that determined or um, decided, you know, in terms of making mm-hmm. the, the parent group represent different age groups, different um, diversity factors, et cetera. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, that's a great question. So we had six parents um, that were on uh, that were part of the reviewer or among our 44 reviewers. Um, and so uh, the parents are we, we have a, a, a GTCAC, a Citizens Advisory Committee uh, that we work with uh, in, the, in our office. Uh, some of you maybe have attended some of their meetings or you've they've spoken occasionally in front of the board. So you may be familiar with the GTCAC. And so usually when we have uh, situ- like things like this where we're, we're doing anything where we're looking for stakeholder input um, from parents and families, a lot of times we'll go to the CAC and we'll ask them. Um, and, and then sometimes, uh, honestly, it's just people that uh, folks in our office know who are parents mm-hmm. for a variety, either because they're parents because the, the, our, our resource teachers are have kids in the system themselves and so they they know other people who are parents and of course sometimes we have people who are within the system who have a dual role uh, they're they're both a faculty member and a parent and so um, it, it depends a little bit in terms of how those people are found um, in, in terms of like uh, uh, there's there's no sort of like set procedure for saying this is how we choose who's on the committee um, 
we we mostly just sort of ask around to find people who are willing to do it because it is a fair amount of work. Um, some of particularly for some of our books in uh, fourth and fifth grade, you know, they're they're full on novels written for youngsters, but still it takes some time to to go through them carefully and to write a thoughtful review. So um, anyway, so there isn't a specific sort of selection process to determine what teachers or CNI staff or uh, uh, family members, parents uh, review the materials. It's more uh, sort of involves our office reaching out to people that we know and asking if they would be willing to to take on the responsibility and put in the time to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let me see, Miss Pumphrey. This might not be needed, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Just wanted to point out that the, the actual um, wording regarding um, notification to the public is in rule and not policy, but I did make a note about the oh. policy itself. So if it needed to be discussed, um, Ms. Howie will let me know. Thank you. And um, OK. All right. And any other questions about the review of elementary advanced academic books? Does this require a motion? I, I do not believe it does. It was more of an informational item, but um, I might check my little book over here. I don't okay. think it does. I don't, I don't think that would be in your little book. If you're talking about Robert, I'm not sure he would. <laughs> yes. I don't no, think I mean, Robert would know about this one. <laughs> I don't think it does because it's not a contract. Um, right. No. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Kearns and Ms. Wistead. Thank um, you Dr. all. Wistead. I'm sorry, Dr. Wistead. Um, so the next part of the agenda is further business, and we do have a little bit of further business. So back in May or whenever we did it and made the schedule for this year's committee meetings, we did not include a December meeting because for some reason, historically, they just December being a crazy month, I think they just skipped December. However, it is part of our responsibility to approve contracts before they go to the contract committee. And there's three contracts that need to be approved for the December, I guess, fourth um, contract committee. So which means we need to add another meeting um, so that we are doing our responsibility. So one of the dates that's been proposed, um, Ms. Cox, what was the date that you had proposed? It's November 27th. It's a Monday. OK, November 27th at the same time. Um, do any committee members, I'm looking at my calendar too, any committee members um, unable to attend on the 27th at 4.30? OK, I want to ask Ann. <laughs> All right, so we will add, so our next committee meeting will be on the 27th. Um, of November, um, and then our fun after that will be on January 4th. And I guess we just need to look ahead when we make that a plan for next year's meetings as far as not skipping a month um, because of the contract piece. Does anybody else have any further business they'd like to discuss? This is a first for us in a long time. I guess those extra meetings are, are paying off. Nobody? OK, I'm um, hearing none. The meeting of the curriculum committee is now adjourned. Thank you everyone for your presentations and thank you committee members for your questions and everyone have a nice evening. <laughs>